Hey guys, welcome back to Earth Sky. I'm Dave Adalian, your host. And today we are going to be talking with Dr. Aylwin Scally, who is a, gen a lecturer in the genetics department at the University of Cambridge in their biological sciences department. Um, and he is also the co-author of a very interesting study that uses, just came out by the way, uses mathematical models of modern DNA to trace the evolutionary pathway of humans. In other words, how did we get here from there? And um, so let's bring him on out. Come on out, Helwyn. Glad Hello. to have you. Thank you for joining us, sir. Appreciate it. Very, very glad to be here. So why don't you tell us briefly a, the gist of what your study concluded? It's uh, what, what are you trying to stall? What are you trying to understand here? Let, let's just get right to it. Well, I guess what we're interested in the, the evolutionary past of humans. And for a long time, um, all of the information, all of the evidence we had for human evolution was coming from fossils right. um, and, uh, and people, you know, getting lucky and digging up fossils and looking at the shapes and kind of comparing them. And then we started to get lots of human genetic data uh, from people alive today. Mm -hmm. um, and all that genetic data is, in, is, is descended, inherited from our ancestors, many of whom we can go all the way, you know, back to deep in the past. And so the, the question then is, can we use that genetic data to also to add more information about, uh, you know, to fill out the picture of, uh, of human evolution in the past? And so that's what this study is contributing to. This, people have done lots of other studies, tried to take the same approach, but uh, this is a, a, a development of that approach. Okay. And so you guys did this a little bit differently and you used a mathematical model. You, I, if I understood the paper correctly, you put together 10 different scenarios and then used mathematical modeling to find out which one actually matches the data you have. Is that, is that right? I mean, essentially, yeah, the, the, that's a, a common approach when you're doing, um, uh, when you're doing mathematical modeling or when you're trying to, infer information from a, a set of genetic data you would look at lots of different scenarios and then you'd see which one fits best and there's a question about well does it fit I enough is it are you confident that is it that it's a, a much better fit than the others to be confident that's the, the the answer but that's the general kind of approach that we would take um and you know i should say it's it, it's the latest in a line of mathematical models um, with, that we've, as a field, have successively made more complicated and more sophisticated, trying to get at more kind of specific questions about the past. Okay. So what did you find? What exactly did you find? Well, there's a split back there and there were two human yeah. pop, or are these, are these actually homo sapiens? Tell us about the population. Yeah, lots of questions. I mean, so, so people are familiar with the fact that today humans live in lots of different populations all over the world. They're not, obviously, they're not completely separate. Uh, some are closer to each other than, than, than others, but nevertheless, there's lots of what you might call population structure um, in present day humans. And the question is, was that also true in the past? Or if you go back far enough, would you find all of our ancestors living just in one place? Um, we're fairly sure it was in Africa because that's where all the oldest fossils were. But nevertheless, was it really just in one, was were all our ancestors just in one small part of Africa, living together as a single group, or was it something a little bit more like, um, maybe more like the way we live today, with different groups of humans, all of them contributing to our um, ancestry in in different proportions? So that was the kind of that was the question we addressed, and and indeed we did find out that that the the model of multiple groups fits better to the data than a single ancestral group, and we're talking about you know, many hundreds of thousands of years ago, all the way back as far as <clears throat> well over a million years ago. That that's the time period we're looking at. About a million and a half years ago, I think I recall. That's about as far back as we can, as we see this kind of population structure um, emerging, yeah. yeah. And you asked, are these Homo sapiens? I mean, um, that to some extent is a question um, which is, uh, you know, which is open to, to debate because genetic evidence can't in itself tell us much about what these individuals looked like, or or, right. or, or, or necessarily how they were, how they lived, or what their their diet, etc., uh, was. But um, we do know that's around the time when we start to see Homo sapiens fossils appearing in Africa. So 
um, it's and that we know that they were our ancestors. So mm -hmm. for sure, um, by certainly by the end of this period, it's likely that we would call these um, these these people Homo sapiens. Okay, so essentially the same the same as us. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the the people at the end of the study period from us. Is that that essentially correct or? I would say that's an open question, and it's one okay. that I would want to defer to, uh, you know, someone who's a paleoanthropologist who studies the fossils, and they would have probably different opinions. Uh, they often uh, have, a, have a very intense rouse about which, uh, you know, <laughs> which of these fossils is our ancestors and which is which is not. That's true. So the study says that there were two ancestral populations of modern humans, and they split about a million and a half years yeah. ago. Yeah. And then re re remer they they came back together. They exactly. They came back together about three, about 300,000 years ago. Um almost certainly that was in Africa um and and there and from then uh you find our ancestors in Africa <clears throat> excuse me until about um uh 50 to 60,000 years ago and that's when there was a later emergence of all of the mm -hmm. our ancestors out of Africa all around the world. Um, to, to where we live today. So this was sort of a final mixing. Well, not the final mixing, but a, a major mixing of yes. human DNA. Yeah. Tell us how the populations played out. Who contributed what and, and how big were they? Where were they? Do we know where they were? So, so, kind of thing. so in our model, we have, um, we find that, um, so the model has two populations. And I'll talk, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the fact that although that's what the model says, um, it could also be that there were multiple, you know, three, four, many populations. It, we're just saying that the two population fits better than a single population. We didn't explicitly look at whether there might have been more. And um, so to some extent, this model is standing for some greater degree of complexity. But anyway, in the model, there's about 80% of, uh, of our ancestry today coming from one of these and 20 percent of our ancestry coming from the other one. So it's quite a substantial mix. It's not just a few percent, a small no. contribution. It's quite a, a substantial mix between these two. So one fifth of our DNA came from one population and yes. four fifths from the other. Yes. Which was the larger population? That's not so clear. It's a little oh. bit hard to, to tell. Yes, just one of the fact features of the mathematical model is that that, that aspect of it is less easy to see than the, than, than the proportion or the fact that they were separate. So, um, you know, in other words, um, you can play with different versions of which one was bigger and which one was smaller. Um, uh, and, you, you know, it's not clear which model fits better. One thing that is clear, however, is that the majority population, that's the one that gave us 80%, four fifths, um, initially at the very earliest stages, sort of just after this split happened about a million and a half years ago, there was what we call a bottleneck. Uh, so oh. that means that the population went through a very small, a period of very small size. Um, that seems to be a signal that we that we see quite strongly. Um, it then expanded um, after that, but uh, but that was, a, that, and that event, you know, that could have been something that happened, say, when, when there was a migration maybe out mm. of Africa um, or to another part of Africa. And um, there are lots of things that might cause that. In a yeah, probably impossible to speculate about what would have caused that. Um, so what does this tell us about our ancestors and how can this guide further field research, further mathematical, uh, mathematical, mathematical model research? I like that new word. I mean, in one sense, um, it, 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 tools like this, like the one that we've developed, um, we could continue to make them more and more complicated, um, mm. you know, add in additional structure, additional populations, try to tease out whether or not we think there were two or three um, questions like that. Um, that's a kind of an ongoing program in, of, of research, and I, I, and I expect there will be more information that's coming out of the genome. Uh, the genome is a very, very large, um, molecule with an incredible <clears throat> amount of information present. So I don't think we've finished mining what we can get out of it. Um, but uh, the other aspect of this is that, you know, this is humans are just one of many species and um, you can take the same approach you, and you can look um, at other species. You can look at our evolutionary cousins, the great apes. We can look at other mammals. We can look all, all around the, uh, the tree of life to some extent and see, can we, can we, can we see, 
you know, what kind of story was there in those species in the past? Did, are these kind of population, deep population structures common uh, or, 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 or not? Wow. So this has the potential to really unfold the story of the evolution of DNA as a whole. That's I think amazing. it certainly can help people who are interested in questions like how does speciation happen? Why do we see, say, two or three species today that are, we know they're closely related, <clears throat> but we want to, we would like to know how did they split? When did that happen? And what kind of things happen? We, have, we often have quite a simple model for that. Um, and this will, this kind of approach will help us make that a little bit more complicated and, uh, uh, and help us understand, you know, what, what happens, where, where do these species come from? And give us a little bit more of a granular picture, yes, better, exactly. better information. Okay, so the one thing that is interesting is that the study draws a connection between the majority ancestral population and Neanderthals and Denis Denisovians. That's right. What does this imply about the relationship between modern humans and these archaic human groups? Um, what I mean, we already knew from, because people were, um, um, quite amazingly, were able to, to sequence DNA from Neanderthals and from this sister group of Neanderthals, Den Denisovans. Uh, we already knew uh, what their genome sequences were. So um, when we took those genome sequences and compared, to, uh, compared them to the, the sequences that we were looking at, the ancestral sequences that we find, yes, we find that um, uh, it looks like that they, the divergence between our ancestors and Neanderthals was probably occurred in this in this majority population, the one that contributed most of our ancestry. Um, now we already knew that humans and Neanderthals had an ancestor had a divergence around about 500, 600,000 years ago. That's that's something we were already able to tell. Um, but this does maybe suggest that um, it, th this maybe adds some weight to the the idea that maybe one of these two populations, this this majority population, maybe that wasn't in Africa. Maybe there was an earlier sort of outside Africa, or 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 at least the very at very at the very least maybe they were close to um, the north eastern part of Africa because we know that Neanderthals were right. outside Africa. Neanderthals are, right. are, are, are a European West Asian group, so so it maybe starts to give us some evidence of where these groups might have might have been. Okay, that's that's fantastic. That really is fantastic. So. Are you working on any new projects with this group now, or what's in the, what's in the what's in store for us? What new I, things can we expect you to do, bring us? Yeah, I mean, I think I would. Uh, I, I, I think one thing is that we would be interested to try and see um, can we uh, tease out some of these questions that you um, asked about. Uh, you know, are we talking about a single group? Are we talking about multiple mm. groups? Is it just, was it a clean separation i mean do we have to have these two groups really at opposite sides of africa so that with so that they never meet or could there have been some sort of ongoing <clears throat> you know genetic exchange at a very low level those kinds of questions would help i think interpret you know where how big a range are we talking about are we talking about you know are we talking about one bit of africa still or or or, or, or is it the whole place or even outside Africa. Wow, that's uh, just an amazing amount of detail you could pull from that. We yeah. have a question from a viewer. Um, he would like to know how accurately can technology help scientists measure and observe evolution, especially from fossils? Can you can you speak to that, or is that a little out of your wheelhouse? No, I mean, uh, one of the most amazing things that's happened in human evolution, or in fact in evolution uh, in the last few decades is the is the ability to get DNA from some fossils. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, we're only really able to go back, um, you know, about 40 or 50,000 years, right. um, which is a lot more recent than uh, more, more recently than any of the thing, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the time period we're talking about here. But even that still gives us an amazing kind of window into an actual genome sequence from that from the past. It's like having a new telescope in astronomy or something like that. It's literally that kind of, of, of power. A new window on the universe. Yeah. Yes. Now the, the same viewer also, Raj, also asks, and maybe we can we can wrap this up here. I don't know if this is something you'll want to address. From the cradle of humanity in Africa to the future, what is the possible outcome or outcomes of our evolution? Where are we going from here? That's a heck of a speculation. If you want to, maybe we could wrap it up with that. Do you think we're going well, someplace or is it 
is, is I mean, one of the things about evolution is that it's not really directed. It doesn't really have, it doesn't know where it's going. It's just responding to what happens right there, right now. So um, it's sort of in our hands as a species where we end up and where we go. You know what? Th that reminds me, uh, one of my professors in biology described evolution as trying to adjust your car by throwing screwdrivers at it from across the room. <laughs> Aylwin. Dr. S Dr. Scally, thank you so much for joining us today. That was a very informative look at your work, and we appreciate you stopping in. Hey, and folks, thank you for, for viewing today. Um, I hope you learned something. If you did, hit like, subscribe to our channel, stop by and see us at earthsky.org. Remember, folks, one earth, one sky, earth sky. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.